epilogue. <clears throat> Half a week later, Norman is combing the barren deserts of Belangu, searching for the ruins of Alizir. He is tracked in the slaver to this place and wants to deal with the problem before it even gets started this time. Nip it in the bud, he thinks to himself. There are no mountains here, just sand and dunes. So many dunes. It is hard to walk this land without tripping into sand. Slow and steady, however, he is passing the Gosa Barrens of South Belangu and entering the sandbars of the central desert. This is where the ruins of Alazir lie, a former place of worship for the priests of Eon in the First Age. These barrens are rumored to have the infamous guild of thieves and assassins known as the Cravens. They have kept the to Belangu since their problems with the membership in the First Age. They are rumored to be both in hiding in Belangu and Mangor. Norman is ever watchful for movement. Do the sands hurt your face? Asks someone from behind. Norman swings around and pulls out a glowing pink stone, and it shocks the face of the mysterious person with electricity. Just enough to stop them in their tracks. It goes out in a single direction, arching out in different paths. The man falls out to the sand holding his left arm to his face. The man removes a dagger from the pocket of his cloth, cloth coat and is wearing a leathery leg wraps. Wearing leathery leg wraps. He comes at Norman with great speed, rotating his dagger so that it faces down and bringing his hand to his opposing ear. Norman brings out the stone again and it strikes many times over and over again. The man screams in agonizing pain as his face is bombarded. It begins to smoke and Norman just keeps holding the stone up with his index finger and thumb. <clears throat> Ford is not very large, but feels his hand. After about a minute of this, the man's face is completely mutilated and melted off. He lies broken on the sand, the sand and wind coursing through his clothes and waving his coat tail around as he lays on his back. This must have been a rogue craven out in the desert looking for victims. Norman was very surprised he did not detect him, even with the loud wind against his ears. They must be masters at hiding in plain sight in the desert, avoiding one's senses. Norman is not even certain of his mission, if Fenros is in the ruins. His leads, however, are reliable, and it usually works out for the best. The sandbar is close. The water is somewhat salty, but he will need to drink. It is dire. It is nearly noon, and he sees the ruins in the distance now, tucked away ever so slightly with the sandbar waters. He goes down to drink, and a look of disgust comes over him, but he must drink it, for it is very hot in Belangu, especially this time of year, especially this time of day. Later on, he reaches the ruins. It is quiet. The wind has died down some. He enters the ruins brightly lit by the sun and meets Fenros and Mestraga inside. Witch hunter, Fenros roars. Men, Norman does not waste time with words. He pulls out his stone and it shocks him, just like the craven. Fenros yells, not this time, witch hunter, this time you die. Mestraga begins to enact some magic ritual on a square stone slab doused with purple paint and the sign of devil and the devil lord of Pax. Fenros wrestles Norman to the ground, avoiding the shocks so far mostly, and Mestraga begins to utter a chant. A red wavy tailed humanoid devil's image hovers above the stone and it says, I have come, bring forth the sacrifice. Fenros then looks up past Norman's shoulder at it and yells, Mestraga, take her, she is the sacrifice. Mistraga looks at Fenros with anger and disbelief. Me? You swine. Mistraga attacks the image of the devil lord, but it passes right through him. It laughs. I am but an image woman. You cannot hurt me. I am elsewhere doing other business. Fenros yells once more. Take her. Take her now. The image then says, no, the sacrifice is unfit. I must go. Fenros looks dismayed. He and Norman have not been actually fighting this whole time. Norman has just been holding him down. Miss Draga puts her hands together, fingers and, and all, and forms a lance of multicolored light and sends it forth toward Fenros. It witches by Norman, piercing Fenros's heart. Fenros smiles a demented smile as blood oozes from his lips. He falls limp beneath Norman. 
Norman gets up and dusts himself off, then looking upon Miss Kraga. Miss Kraga then says, I suppose you will want to fight me as well. Norman's eyes deviate, and he turns back, saying, No, I came for him mostly, as succubus I can let live. Miss Kraga slowly and flirtatiously walks to Norman and kisses him on the lips, licking his top lip with the tip of her tongue as she backs away. Norman smiles. Why don't you join me, Miss Straga? You would make a, a fine partner. Miss Straga blushes a bit. Partner? Well, I have always admired you, witch hunter. So yes, I would join you. Norman gets serious for a moment and says, You understand it will take time for me to trust you, but a team we will make, a very good team. Norman looks about. Ah, uh, this used to be a temple of Eon long ago. Norman says, trying to change the subject. Miss Straga rubs his hip and, hip and says, Mm-hmm. Norman looks at her and doesn't know if he sh should be proud or angry, as her beauty is almost beyond description to him. The enslavers are but a memory now, and for just a little bit of the bigger picture, the world is a little safer now. Let us head to civilized lands. Mangor is our closest option. It is not barren at all except for the mountains around it. I tire of this place, says Norman to Miss Draga. She then says, we came by camel. It is still outside. Miss Draga looks oddly shy and says, I have never had a place of my own, Norman. And I know you have so much gold and treasure, you don't know what to do with it all. Why don't you buy me a house in Mangor? If you stay with me there, it wouldn't be so bad either, you know. I could keep you warm on those cold nights without late hours. They begin to laugh, Norman rubbing his nose. We shall see, Miss Draga. You are very, very beautiful after all. And really, you are not to blame in all of this. The two travel by camel to Mangor, a civilized place surrounded by places that are not so much. Isolated and independent, this tiny nation of tradesmen and smiths has stood the test of time. The next morning, they wake up in bed with one another in the end there. Miss Draga rubbing his back and shoulders, and he sits up in bed. She lets out a small giggle, saying, See, I told you. Norman smiles and kisses her forehead, grabbing her head gently and walking out into the tavern. She joins him at a table, and they have some wine. There are no patrons having drinks, as the city does not see many travelers and does not have many people living in it. It is the city of Gressel, ruled just by, by just about no one. No king to speak of is here, and the people just work hard and live by the sword and the coin. I will buy you a home here if there is one, Norman says to Miss Draga. Can I count on you, Norman? She asks from flirtatiously. Norman responds, saying, of course. They talk all morning about what the enslavers plotted and how it never came to fruition. Norman was surprised they did not want world domination like he thought. According to Mastraga, there was no rhyme or reason, just bloody packs and conspiring on a smaller scale. They scorned the world for using the dragon essence, believing that true magic should come from packs with devils. Magic is drawn from the tempest, using the essence of unmaterialized dragons. So all in all, both are not that very different. Norman slides a large knapsack full of gold and precious gems to Mastraga on the table. She asks, Is this a gift of love, Norman Gall? She then smiles and looks down. Norman then coughs and says, Maybe. He then pulls out a small square piece of parchment with a symbol on it written in blood. He holds it to the candle burning on the table and it burns. Red light burns from it in waves. It burns instantly once the fire really gets started. Is that? Miss Draga asks, staring in awe. Yes, it's your pack with Devlin. Now he can haunt you no longer. You are free. Miss Draga strokes her index finger against his hand lying on the table and says, I must thank you for giving me a chance. They lose themselves in conversation again and all is well in the rugged little town of Gressel. Back at Darkens Tower, underneath deep in the secret, in a secret lab, a portal has been there since Darkens turned to demonic influence. It finally closes, ending the scourge of all demons in this world. It was the enslaver's greatest secret. Devlin has closed it, either giving up or moving on, with no mortal servants left to carry out his work in the world. The devices that held the portal open are still there, though. A stone dangling from a rope above where it was, 
and a well of dark ooze with a single step below it. Devil and an enemy of man, the younger brother of Eon himself, is no more. <coughs> Meanwhile, the united forces of Ascadia City, the dwarves, the mercenaries, and others march towards Sor Topa. They will meet south of Hypos. A sect of elvish agents called the Duskwalkers have proposed a plan to the council to avert the war altogether, based on Lita's information. They have gone ahead to plan their attack. It is noontime and the Dusk Walkers are sneaking about the jungles of El Barat near Soratopa. It is a do or die mission. They plan to get Hegarbro to turn on Dane and send Soratopa into civil war. Hegarbro has secretly agreed to meet with the Dusk Walkers in the jungles far from far from the castle. The Dragon Knights have been told to stay in the city until they are called to fight. Dragons flying about would ruin their surprise attack if it even comes down to it to it now. The dusk walkers wait patiently in a long pathway made barely visible with foliage. However, this is the meeting place. They hear a noise coming from far down the path toward the east. It is Hegavro and his elite Felgen bodyguards. They walk quickly down the path to where the dusk walkers are. The elves begin to go for their weapons, but one gives the orders not to silent, not too silently. As Hegavro approaches, one crosses his arms. Hegavro signals his guards to stop where he is standing. So you wish to bring an end to all of this right here and now, do you? Hegavro says in a shifty way. It is true, I can't stand Dane. He is crazy and doesn't have the intelligence of a rock. He looks at us felgans as lesser to his orcs. Enough is enough, and I am in, Hagerbro says to the Dusk Walkers. The elves look at him and ask, When we come, will you draw steel with us? Hagerbro then replies, Yes, most certainly. The war-hungry orcs have it coming. I will make it possible. My Felgen revolutionaries will listen to anything I say. One of the Dusk Walkers then pauses down and says, I believe I can trust you, Hagerbro. You don't seem like Dane at all. We will attack Sortopa soon. Our army is near. The time is nigh. Hagerbro turns around and he and his guards walk back down the almost hidden path of jungle, straight and narrow as it may be. The army is ready to fight and soon a massive force will fight an unsuspecting smaller force for the sake of Fendraggle. Queen Lita has been elected to take the throne when and if they win, as Mirasami wants to live a quiet life with her husband. True metal will be tested this day. Hagerbro issues the orders to take out the orcs, who are greater in number and have red dragon whelps on their side. The unit of fighters from Ascadia City hear the stage of battle. As dragon whelps shoot fire and light up the sky, the night sky, they hear them being cut down and orcs yelling, traitorous whelps. They're pretty far from the action, one dwarf exclaims, I want in. Just then, one of the dusk walkers whispers, no, master dwarf. The Dusk Walker then tells the entire army, All right, we shall stay here to make sure things go according to plan. Lita, you stay. We will swear you in. The rest may do as you please. Many leave. If you stay, their armor rattle in the night. Felgans are putting orcs to the sword and axe left and right. The battle ensues all night. By morning, the few that stayed walked their way into Fendrakel to see mostly orc and dragon corpses. None slept much that night because of the verge of importance. They make their way to the castle to find Hegavro on the throne. The room is full of surviving Felgans. Hegavro gets up and tells his men, I am tired of fighting. Get your things and we shall march to Felgen Bridge and beg them to take us back after what we have done here. The day wears on and Fendragel is back in human hands once more. Kriev, who elected to stay, as was knighted for his efforts to unify the world. Hagerbro was given a full pardon for his many crimes and marches his remaining army back to Felgen Bridge. I think I promised to make one of you captain. Well, I have changed my mind, says Kriev to his dwarves. No, I shall make one of you king. I have been king for far too long now. It just wouldn't be proper anymore. I want the dwarf king to stay on the surface and help this world overcome its ills, yells Kriev. Cries and cheers can be heard from Fendragel Castle as Kriev makes Nazorndr, the youngest dwarf, their king. 
Lita is sworn into the throne and word spreads all throughout the world of Hector Rose good deed. He returns to his foe as a hero, not a villain. Caravans take to the roads again in the south from all the villages, wrongfully enough, even though the bandits are back in business again. The orcs will think twice before they attack Fendragal again, but the threat always looms. Darkin never escapes his prison in the deep and is kept under the watchful eye of the dwarves. Kriev takes time to speak with him at great length and think, thinks he is reforming him to a degree. There will be a day when even Darkin can be trusted. He is simply too dangerous to let out. Let no one question the strength and honor of those who are free, and even those who fight the free for it is choice that gives them their power. There is no greater power than a free man and the gravity and voice of his deeds.